I'm going to read more about Zen and Haiku in uh, Suzuki, the famous uh, writer upon Zen. And we have the famous Haiku, page 258, section 5. Puri ikiya kawazu tabi komi musi no oto. The old pond, ah, a frog jumps in, the water sound. This is said to have been the first revolutionary alarm given by Basho to the haiku world of 17th century Japan. Before him, haiku had been mere plays on words with nothing deeper than pleasantry. It was Basho who gave them a new start by this utterance on the old pond. You claim that Basho was your favorite, but we thought Segyo was. The story as to how he came. Your iPhone has been updated to so and so. So what? They're always updated. Their life. That's a deeper bind of the relationship. Life is updated continuously. Do I have to put a passcode? Create a passcode? No. Don't. So what do I do now? Go out. Please don't have updates. Doing updates by themselves. They update the software, then ask you to put in a passcode all the time. So I didn't do it. Yeah. What do I do now? You do as your technical systems tell you to do. Do what, do what your phone tells you to do. That's a deep provider to create a passcode, and I have to create a passcode. You want to create a passcode? I, if I cannot, I don't have to. I don't want to, but I can flash it. Do you have a passcode? Mm -hmm. You have to have a passcode to not have a passcode. It's the not of having. It doesn't give me an option. Now give me the phone. This is by force. This is the technological forcing. You're being forced. You put one in and then shut it off. That's good. But it's considered assault, software assault. Battery by software. Ah. Basho was studying Zen under his master, Buko. Buko one day paid him a visit and asked, How are you getting on these days? Basho said after the recent rain, the moss had grown greener than ever. He shot a second arrow to see the depth of Basho's understanding of Zen. What Buddhism is there even before the moss had grown greener? At this question, is tantamount Christ saying, quote, I am even before Abraham was. You think... Christ was before Abraham. Mm, was no. the Christ power? Was Christ before Abraham? No. Ah, the power, yeah. The, okay, the, Christ the, was before Abraham, but Christ can manifest in Jesus, right? But Christ himself was before Abraham. The Zen master wants to know who this I is. With Christians, probably the mere assertion, the I am was enough. But in Zen, the question must be asked, and a more concrete answer must be forthcoming, for this is an essential part of Zen intuition. So Buko asks, what is there even before the world came into existence? That is to say, where is God even before he uttered, let there be light? Hmm. 
Yeah, if you actually go back in your back and through your past lives, through reincarnation, if you travel back through your past lives, you come all the way to the Big Bang. Who called the Zen master is not just talking about the recent rainfall and the green moss growing fresher. What he wants to know about is the cosmic landscape prior to the creation of all things, when is timeless time? Is it no more than an empty concept? If it is not, we must be able to describe it somehow for others, Basho's answer was. A frog jumps into the water and hear the sound. Basho's answer, at the time it was uttered, did not have the first line, the old pond. He's saying that the, his answer at the time didn't have the old pond, which it is reported he added later on to make a complete haiku of 17 syllables. So the correct haiku is, frog jumps into the water and hear the sound. He added the old pond. I like hmm. that one, old pond. Jump, the frog jumps hmm. in the water. So. Now he has 17 syllables. We may ask now, where is that something revolutionary in it, which marked the beginning of modern haiku poetry? Is it Basho's insight into the nature of life itself or into the life of nature, which forms the background of this verse? He really penetrated into the depths of the whole creation. What he saw there came out as depicted in his haiku on the old pond. Let me try to give a little more intelligible account of Basho, whereby we, with our prosaic two modern minds, may understand him. Most of us are liable to interpret the haiku on the old pond as describing a scene of solitude or tranquility. We think it's just a nice scene of tranquility. Or is it more than that? And according to them, the following is the line of imagination they would pursue. Quote, an old ancient pond is likely to be located in some old temple grounds filled with many stately trees. Around the pond also there are odd-looking shrubs and bushes with outstretching branches and thickly grown leaves. Such surroundings add to the tranquility of the upright, unrippled surface of the pond. When this is disturbed by a jumping frog, the disturbance itself enhances the reigning tranquility. The sound of the splash reverberates, and the reverberation makes us all the more conscious of the serenity of the whole. However, this consciousness is awakened only in him whose spirit is really in consonance with the world spirit itself. It took Basho, the truly great haiku poet, to voice this intuition or inspiration. Let me repeat, to understand Zen as a gospel, gospel of quietism is not at all in the right, nor is it the way to interpret Basho's haiku, for it is far from being an appreciation of tranquility. You think it's just tranquility? It's a, a, a double mistake is thus committed as regards Zen. I have, I have had occasion to give my views in my several books on the subject and will confine myself here to the correct interpretation of Basho, first of all. We must know that a haiku does not express ideas, but that it puts forward images reflecting intuitions. These images are not figurative representations made use of by the poetic mind, but they directly point to original intuitions. Indeed, they are intuitions themselves. He's saying it has to be almost pure intuition. I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, it usually it's leans true. towards intuition there. When the latter are attained, the images become transparent and are immediate impression expressions of the experience. And intuition in itself, being too intimate, too personal, too immediate, cannot be communicated to others. To do this, it calls up images by means of which it becomes transferable. But to those who have never had such an experience, it is difficult, even impossible, to reach the fact itself merely through images, because in this case, images are 
transformed uh, into ideas or concepts, and the mind then attempts to give them an intellectual interpretation, as some critics do, with Basho's haiku on the old pond. Such an attempt altogether destroys the inner beauty, the truth and beauty of the haiku. As long as we are moving on the surface of consciousness, we can never get away from ratiocination ratios, ratios, and the old pond is understood as symbolizing solitude and tranquility. And the frog jumping into it in the sound thereof are taken for instruments whereby to set off and off. To me, it doesn't symbolize Also to beauty. increase. It's something what? beautiful, I would say. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's well, what I, trend, I think of something Lovely. The image. That makes me feel good. That's well, what comes that's to my okay. Mind. That's okay. The general sense of eternal quietness. Is it eternally quiet? <clears throat> is it just tranquility or is it eternal quietness? Well, there's nothing. <clears throat> there's no eternity. <laughs> No, it doesn't quietness. But the Basho, the poet, is not living there as we are. He has passed through the outer crust of consciousness away down into its deepest recesses, into a realm of the unthinkable, into the unconscious, which is even beyond the unconscious, generally conceived by the psych psychologist. Basho's old pond lies on the other side of eternity, where timeless time is. You have to be enlightened to read his poem. We shouldn't eat garlic in the morning. We shouldn't eat garlic. What difference does it make if we ate garlic mm -hmm. in the Not morning? It's a great morning food. No? Great morning food. Not. It's not. Is that a intuition? Are you going to write a poem? No, I'm just going to weigh my stomach. Garlic in yourself. the morning. You could say, first line, garlic in the morning. Yeah, that's repulsive. Huh? Repulsive. Repulsive. <laughs> garlic in the morning, repulsive. Mm -hmm. It's not really repulsive. It doesn't express it truly. Mm -hmm. it, tasted good. it tasted good when we ate it. It tasted good. <laughs> garlic in morning tastes good. <laughs> not garlic. I mean, <laughs> it was in the... Garlic... In, in the morning, pesto. it was in the pesto, pesto spread. Garlic in morning, okay, with me. <laughs> we haven't written haiku enough to be able to write haiku. My poems are way too long. I gotta learn to simplify poetry. <laughs> we have to go back to writing haiku. That way it would be more economical. I guess if we got it more and more economical, uh, a word would be the poem. Just one word alone. Here, or maybe two, or for maybe me, three. If I wrote shorter poems, it would be more economical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Old Pond lies on the other side of eternity, where timeless time is. It is so old, indeed, that there is nothing more ancient. No scale of consciousness can measure it is. Hence, all things come. It is the source of the world of particulars, yet in itself it shows no particularization. We come to it when we go beyond the rainfall and the moss growing greener. But when this is intellectually conceived, it becomes an idea and begins to have an existence outside this world of particulars, thus making itself an object of intellectualization. It is by intuition alone that this timelessness of the unconscious is truly taken hold of, but, and this intuitive grasp of reality never takes place. When a world of emptiness is assumed outside our everyday world of the senses. For these two worlds, sensual and supersensual, are not separate but one. Therefore the poet sees into his unconscious, not through the stillness of the old pond, but through the sound stirred up by the jumping frog. You know, we had lots of frogs. It wakes up. The frog is like They're the actually, the actually, we had frogs in the pond. Oh, do you think the frog plays yeah. the role of the music of the spheres? Naturally, we had the croaking frogs, which are, the bullfrogs were very loud. Mm -hmm. But actually, you did have the sound of them jumping in the water. When you, you could be sleeping on the farm in Ohio, on Smith Pond. In the prior reading, we talked about Smith Pond and uh, the ponds of Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> And now we're talking about the frogs jumping in Smith Pond. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. mm.
You believe me when I say I heard the sound of frogs jumping in Smith Pond? Did you have frogs? The Ohio, the pond in Ohio. It's in Ohio. They called it Smith Pond. No, the pond at the Lyle Smith House. <laughs> there was a pond there. Of course. Okay, there was a pond. I thought, uh, but what about the? the um, they say there was something in the pond. The pond. There was a bridge. What the poem exactly? I forgot. Say the poem again. The poem. There's no bridge. Old. Uh, old says, pond. Old pond, it says. Okay. Well, I don't know if it's an old. It's not an so old. So where pond. did it sound from then into the lake? The frog just Maybe jumps it was in. From a stone. It's quiet. Let's say at night on the farm, it's pretty quiet, mm -hmm. and the frogs are loud anyways. But you can hear the frog jump in. Though you can even hear fish jump. Mm -hmm. So. Frog jumped in pond, but we're not sure it was I a heard fish. Frogs. We <laughs> had a pond also in our uh, village. Did you hear the sound of a frog jumping in the pond? Not jumping exactly, but making those horrible sounds. Oh, that's croaking. Goodness. Let's do that, I wonder. I'm reading about a frog. Hmm. Whether or not the frog did or did not jump in. Therefore the poet Therefore the poet sees into his unconscious not through the stillness of the old pond, but through the sound stirred up by the jumping frog without the sound there is no seeing on the part of Basho. Without the unconscious, in which lies the source of creative activities and upon which all true artists draw their inspiration. Now, it is difficult to describe this moment of consciousness when the polarization ceases and rather starts, for these contradictory terms are applicable there. Without pausing a logical inconvenience, it is a poet or the religious genius who actually has this kind of experience. And according to the way his experience is handled, it becomes one case in one case, Basho's haiku, in the other, it's an utterance. Hmm. The human mind can be considered to be made up, as it were, of several layers of consciousness, from a dualistically constructed consciousness down to the unconscious. The first layer is where we generally move everywhere. Everything there is dualistically set up. Polarization is the principle of the stratum. The next layer below is the sub-semi-conscious plane. Things deposited here can be brought up to the full consciousness any time they are wanted. It is the stratum of memory. The third layer is the unconscious, as it is temporarily, ordinarily termed by the psychologist. Memories law as such, since time and are stored up here, they are awakened when there is a general mental upheaval. Memories buried when the memories buried nobody knows how long ago are brought up to the surface when a catastrophe takes place designatedly or accidentally. This unconscious layer of the mind is not the last layer. There is still another, which is really the bedrock of our personality and may be called collective unconsciousness. Wow. Ah, a collective consciousness corresponding somewhat to the Buddhist idea of Aoya Vijnana. That is the all-conserving consciousness, the existence of this Vijnana, or unconscious, may be experimentally demonstrated, but the assumption of it is necessary to explain the general fact of consciousness. Dear, do you think we're connected by the collective unconscious? So we share the same mind? <laughs> technically, technically, you are one with the other person, or all the persons. So your desire is technically mine. <laughs> when you want something, I have to give it to you. <laughs> right? I have to. Psychologically speaking, this way of Vijnana, or collective unconscious, may be regarded as the basis of our mental life, but when we wish to open up the secrets of the artistic or religious life, 
we must have what may be designated cosmic unconsciousness. The cosmic unconsciousness is the principle of creativity, God's workshop where is deposited the moving force of the universe. Uh -huh. When you open up the muse, let's say, to compose or improvise on the piano, is that the cosmic unconsciousness? All creative works of art, the lives and aspirations of religious people, the spirit of in that inquiry, moving the philosophers, all these come from the fountainhead of the cosmic unconsciousness, which is really the storehouse of, of possibilities. Alaya, A L A Y A, storehouse. Basho came across this unconsciousness, and his experience was given an expressive utterance in his haiku. The haiku is not just a singing of the tranquility imagined to be underneath the superficial tumult of the worldly life. His utterance points to something further below, which is at the same time something we encounter in this world of pluralities, and it is an account of this something that our world gains its value and meaning without reckoning on the cosmic unconsciousness. Our life lived in the realm of reality. Relativities loses its moorings altogether. We now can understand why it is not necessary for the Japanese haiku to be long and elaborate and intellectual. It avoids an idea, ideational, ideational, or conceptual construction. When it appeals to ideas, its direct pointing to the unconscious is warped, marred, interrupted, its refreshing vitality forever gone. Therefore, the haiku attempts to offer the most appropriate images in order to make us recall the original intuition as vividly as possible. The images thus hold up, held up and arranged in haiku may not be at all intelligible to those whose minds have not been fully trained to read the meaning conveyed therein. As in the case of Basho's haiku, what can most people who are not educated to appreciate a haiku generally see an enumeration of such familiar objects as an old pond, a jumping frog, and the sound resulting therefrom. It is true that these objects are not merely enumerated, they are also an exclamatory particle, ya, y-a, and a verb of motion, t-o-b-i-k-o-m-u, to-b-como. But I am afraid that the uninitiated may not be able to recognize anything poetically enlivening in these those seventeen syllables so loosely strung, and yet what a truth, deep truth, of intuition is herein given utterance, a truth which cannot be expressed so inspiringly, even in a formidable array of ideas. Religious, instu religious intuitions are usually communicated in simple terms. They are direct straightforward utterances without equivocation, though in Zen we find a great number of poetical quotations, including haiku. But as soon as they are subjected to intellectual analysis, the philosophers and theologians have to vie with one another in writing volume after volume on the subject. In a similar amount of the poetic intuitions and aspirations that move the haiku poet may be easily be occasions for longer and more elaborate pieces of poetry when they are delivered into the hands of another type of poet. As far as original inspiration is concerned, Basho is just as great a poet as any of the West. The number of syllables has nothing to do with the true quality of the poet. This instrument may use the instrument made use of by poets, which is quite accidental, may vary, but we judge them, as well as people not by what is accidental, but by what essentially constitutes them. By way of postscript, I wish to add Senge's characteristic comment on Basho and his rogue. Senge, 1750-1837, was the abbot of so fu ku chi and ha kata kuyoshu. He was not only a fine Zen master, but a painter, calligrapher, and poet full of humor and wit, was loved by the people of all classes, men and women, young and old. He once painted a picture of the banana plant and a frog crouching under it. 
Basho is banana plant in Japanese, and the poet's nom de plume, or basho, comes from it. So when you're eating a banana, are you in a way consuming basho? Gajo is a banana plant in Japanese, and the poet's nom de plume, Basho, comes from it. Sege now writes over the picture a haiku, so to speak, a frog soliloquy. soliloquy. Kiki, araba, tandi basho ni. Kika sete. If there were a pond around here, I would jump in and let Basho hear the plot. Right, let him jump in. I'm, I'm not reading about it, okay? I thought you were going to read some poems. You want me to jump into the pond? I want you to read some poems. Okay? I, I just read one. This one here is, If there were a pond around I here, like that. I would jump in and let Basho hear the plop. Yeah, that's I'm going to jump into ending, jump into this reading and uh, make a plop. Um, I'm not going to read it again. I'm going to jump in by, in effect, by ending this reading. <laughs> we had read, The Old Pond, Ah, uh, Frog Jumps In, The Water Sound, by Basho, with analysis. Hmm. Hmm. You don't like heavy analysis? <laughs> I like I like the image of the heavy, heavily intellectualized it's not heavy, analysis. That's crazy analysis. Really? Yeah, you don't go on and on and on and on and on with mistake. But he did. I just Say, read two lines for him. You need the, a whole book to be. Analyzed. Why shoot the reader when it's it's his writing? Blame you him. You choose to read it to me. and Give me a headache, okay? But I'm. And you do that all the time. But why shoot the why reader you when? You need a whole book I'm, to understand a little poem to enjoy a little poem. I'm not the writer. You enjoy it or you don't enjoy it. Then. You didn't enjoy it. No, the poem. If you can All enjoy right. it, if you are able to enjoy it, it's good for you. If you can, that's too bad for you. You don't like analysis. Uh -huh. Not, uh, it's unnecessary, this analysis. We had read about... And you write, okay, a paragraph, not a book, could you say? The reason why... You've been reading an hour about, and uh, then he jumped into the poem. The reason why I read Maybe the way I do is man. to make fun of intellectuals. So I'm actually making fun, fun of, of yourself, of myself. <laughs> I'm making fun of my own tendency to right, intellectualization. That's, that's enough. That's enough. We 